thanks so much, Mia, and thanks to SciLife Lab and the Wallenbergs and everyone for having me here. Um, it's been incredible, as Jared said. And um, so, um, as Mia mentioned, um, if I think about my path to genomics, I bounced back and forth a lot between wanting to study biology and um, enjoying the feeling of sitting down and doing math. And that sort of started in high school when I had this great opportunity to do biology research at MIT for a summer. And there was the first time I met students who were there to um, do math research. And I just really got the bug from them and wrote my first paper paper for the Journal of Number Theory, but then eventually um, I really wanted to go back and discover things in biology as well, and I ended up finding this really great home in computational genomics um, where I can still um, get the feeling of making discoveries from my couch, like in math, but um, yeah, using remote supercomputers to analyze DNA sequences. And so um, I started my, well, in this field just as a one-year master's program in 2010 that I didn't know if I would like or not. And, but it ended up being um, in this really exciting time when the cost of sequencing a human genome was plummeting faster than Moore's Law. Um, and so I got to work on the first edition of um, the Thousand Genomes Project data of a bunch of human genome sequences from all over the world. And today... Um, around when I finished, by the time I finished my PhD, a genome was 10 times cheaper than that. And um, there are all kinds of other possibilities that I didn't even imagine just a few years ago when I started. Um, so basically, um, all of my research boils down to this question of what we can learn about evolutionary history from a genome, or really from thousands of genomes. And um, I think it's um, what I wrote my prize essay about is um, like seeing this in the context of two different ways to view a genome. So in your first biology class, you probably think of it as an instruction manual where um, you sort of read a genome um, from left to right or five prime to three prime and see it as a sequence of genes that um, are, um, tell you building blocks um, for a cell and then when to turn them on in which cells. But um, as a population geneticist, um, we sort of look at alignments um, maybe in a different dimension um, where I've highlighted these past, these genetic variants where some individuals differ from others and these are all relics of um, mutations that happened a long time ago and have had this very rich history ever since as they've been transmitted to the present from very distant ancestors. Um, and so um, each variant starts as a random damage event or copying mistake in one person, um, like many thousands or millions of years ago usually, and then it, um, through a combination of random genetic drift and sometimes interesting forces like selection, um, it gets to a larger frequency that we can observe today. And just by looking at diversity and building mathematical models of this process, we can reconstruct some of what's been happening. And um, so just to get into a little bit about the process of modeling how population diversity changes over time. Um, so I've represented it differently in this picture where you can think about an ancestral population that eventually splits into two and you have these circles representing genetic variants that arise and um, make copies of themselves and sometimes are transmitted by migration events between populations. And sometimes we have these bottleneck events where um, a population contracts down to a small set of founders and um, that causes the genetic makeup to turn over much more quickly than in times when the population is very large. So I spent the first half of my PhD working on methods for reconstructing these types of histories just from genetic material sampled in the present. And um, so... One method I worked on, that I've worked on a lot is um, if you, say, sample two DNA sequences from the same population or different populations, you can look at all of the sites that they're, where the two sequences differ, which in humans is about one out of every 1,000 sites, and then measure the distribution of the distances in between the differences. And so there, there's a lot of information encoded in this spectrum of differences about things like um, 
the time of divergence and migration and um, population bottlenecks occurring. So I applied this method to um, some different human data sets, looking at the out of Africa migration and the settlement of the new world. But I thought I'd tell you guys about a more exotic case study um, where we, um, at Ber my group at Berkeley, um, led by Rasmus Nielsen, collaborated with scientists at the Beijing Genomics Institute. And they sequenced a bunch of polar bears and grizzly bears, and I inferred a demographic history from these sequences. And so what th this history actually contained quite a few surprises, where the first surprise was that these two species only diverged half a million years ago, which is about um, one-tenth as far back as when humans and chimpanzees diverged. So even though they look really different, they're quite closely related, which means there had to have been really rapid rapid selection on polar bears to make them um, look different and adapt to their new environment. And um, so um, polar bears have undergone a much bigger bottleneck where there are tended to be a lot fewer of them settling their new environment. And we also see evidence of ongoing gene flow, only one direction from polar bears into brown bears. And so um, on certain islands in Alaska today, um, you can find polar bear, grizzly bear hybrids. And so what the genetic data shows is that these hybrids always have to go live with the brown bears, um, probably because their coloration makes them unfit for life as a, um, as a polar bear if they have to be camouflaged in the snow. So um, in the middle of my PhD, I switched directions a little bit, and I got really interested in, instead of studying the forces of genetic, the force of genetic drift that um, modulates variation after it's created, I got really interested in studying um, what we can learn about this mutation process that creates the variation, ultimately. Um, and so uh, most population geneticists think of mutation as the most boring of the forces that shapes genetic diversity. And like the, so the expression of this boringness is the molecular clock where um, you, um, the model is to think of mutations just as steady ticks that, are, that occur um, with um, a high degree of regularity um, and that we can use them to measure more interesting processes. But I'm going to show you some findings that suggest that it's not true, even over pretty short time scales. So, um, uh, what might seem like a very simple question is what is the human mutation rate? Um, in other words, um, if you sequence a parent and, or two parents and their child, like how many new mutations um, is the child expected to have every generation? And um, this is very expensive to measure just because it requires sequencing lots of genomes for a few mutations. And so... Um, we didn't have any measurements of this at all, really, until around um, in 2001, when we had a hu one human genome and one chimpanzee genome, and you could count the differences between these and divide it by what we think the um, common ancestral time of them is, based on fossils. And so the number that came out of that was that um, there are about 2.5 times 10 to the minus eighth mutations per site per generation. But then and a decade later, it finally became possible economically to sequence parents and children and count new mutations. And that gave an answer that was more than a factor of two off, um, that, we only, um, that we have a much lower rate than the earlier analyses um, expected. And that was a big deal because we have to use this rate to calibrate models like the polar bear one I showed you. And so this half a million year time, for example, like, depends on us really knowing what the mutation rate is. Um, so after this conflict came out, um, I got to go to this human mutation rate meeting that we had in Leipzig over like, what's going on and what do we do about this problem? And so one of the questions obviously is what really is the mutation rate? But another was just has the mutation rate been slowing down in human history? Because that could explain how the two measurements I mentioned could both be correct and one just reflects more ancient time and the other reflects what it is now. And um, so the way I um, set out to tackle this question a bit more was um, Mm-hmm. 
using cancer as a model system because basically cancer is a perfect um, example of a system where the mutation rate is always changing very fast. Because if you think about the progression from um, an embryo of a human who will in the future get cancer, um, the early embryo um, is replicating in a nice functional way, um, but then by the time the, uh, some organ gets cancer, um, there is a lot that probably breaks in the cells about things like DNA repair. And um, so if you look, if you sequence the genome of a cancer cell and compare it to um, the, ge um, the genome of a healthy cell from the patient, um, you see um, evidence of different mutational signatures acting at different times in the development of a cancer, um, where some are due to sort of norm, um, random healthy mutational processes, or not healthy, but not pathological, and some um, that occur much later um, yeah, have... Um, concrete causes. And you can actually see that the different mutational um, processes leave different balances of changing A's to T's and C's to G's and so on. And um, so one example is tobacco smoking mutates C's to A's in um, but then there are some other processes like um, that um, have internal breakage of a cell um, that then leaves a signature of something like an apobec enzyme that's supposed to vi fight viruses mutating the genome of the cell itself. And so for these signatures, you have to look at the triplet context, the three letter words that the mutations occur in um, to get a hint at what's causing them. So what I decided to do was think about um, whether different mutational signatures might be occurring at different phases of normal germline development, say maybe some mutation types occur more um, in, um, like some mutation types occur during development of sperm versus eggs versus early embryos, which are all ultimately passed to children. And that if the mutation rate is changing um, during human evolution, probably not all of these signatures will change um, in equal rates in all populations. So I hypothesize that we could look for this signature in variation data of examining recent mutations that occur only in Africans or only in Europeans or only in East Asians and looking for evidence that some signatures occur more in some populations than others. And um, I got a stronger signal of this than I ever dreamed of starting the project, where there is a single um, three-letter word, this TCC word, that mutates, um, appears to have been mutating much faster in the European population than in Africans or East Asians. And Europeans and East Asians really only started differentiating on the order of 20,000 years ago. And um, this is definitely a scale where um, the molecular clock model should have said um, like nothing about um, how fast different triplets, mu triplets mutate should have been differentiating. Um, and so just if you look at um, the distribution of this mutation type in populations today where we have significant sequence data sampled, um, it's um, most intense in southern Italy and southern Europe and sort of of intermediate intensity in South Asia and um, like about 50% less frequent in Africa and East Asia. And so um, a model that I'm working on testing is whether what what we're seeing is a relic of a lost mutator allele, a genetic variant um, that existed in Europeans for a time and caused a bunch of these mutations. And um, so um, I don't have time to talk about it now, but I'm starting to see evidence that of other um, pulses of mutator alleles, possibly um, even in the Japanese population relative to other East Asian groups, as well as um, much older ones that you can see um, that appear to be fixed in certain great ape species relative to others. And so if you or anyone else you know is interested in working on these sorts of questions, um, they should come join 
in my new lab that I am starting next month at the University of Washington in the home of Starbucks and Microsoft. 